Hello and welcome back to Witch Fix. I come to you fresh from watching the first 10 episodes of The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina that have been put up on Netflix. So I am here with some thoughts and opinions and some spoilers. So be warned. Just a quick heads up on this episode, there is going to be quite a bit of discussion of transphobia because that's depicted in the series, but also in terms of sexual assault, consent issues and uh, abuse of a minor uh, which was hinted at and some various other things that might make you uncomfortable so just to give you a quick warning before you start listening that is discussed in this episode of the podcast as well as in the show itself so i had previously read and done an episode on the chilling adventures of sabrina comic book so i'm not going to go into like fully all of the differences between that and the tv series because there are a lot but I'm going to cover some of the main ones I think and I took some notes through the first two episodes which is basically where the most similarities to the comic book can be found and from that point on it basically just starts to go its own way and do its own thing. So for starters uh, Sabrina's father and mother are in the TV series dead in an accident and it sort of implied that maybe this was an accident and maybe it wasn't but we don't really find out what happened in the first 10 episodes I've seen so we may find out later. In the comic book obviously her dad is a satanic dirtbag who basically marries the mum just to have a, a half mortal child and then disposes of her to a mental asylum after Sabrina's birth which is not very nice of him and he then subsequently gets imprisoned in a tree for being a git bag so that's very different. And it kind of showed a theme which would carry on throughout the series of things being just generally lightened up and made less horrifying and creepy uh, in terms of comparing the comic book to the TV series. Uh, another thing that's different is the introduction of Madame Satan, played by uh, Michelle Gomez. And in the comic book, Madame Satan puts into a coma the drama teacher at the school and then turns up as a completely new person who is wearing a face that she's stolen from a girl at a summer camp like literally cut her face off and is wearing it uh, and what happens in this case is just that Michelle Gomez starts off playing the teacher and then she is possessed by Madame Satan who in the last episode does actually remove her face to show that she is Madame Satan underneath but why would you do that if you were possessing a body like what why would you have to remove your face another difference is that Madame Satan He's not been raised by accident from hell and is now seeking her revenge on Sabrina as the daughter of her ex-lover, which is the case in the comic book. Basically, she's there as an agent of Satan to make sure that Sabrina signs the Book of the Beast and goes through her dark baptism by manipulating her towards that goal in a very subtle and nefarious way and separating her from her mortal friends and boyfriend in the process. Speaking of boyfriend, Harvey is a completely different character. In both the live action TV series with Melissa Joan Hart and in the comic book, Harvey is a football player and kind of a dumb jock and specifically in the comic book he's very pushy with Sabrina on the issue of like them having sex. He's basically coming across as the stereotypical horror movie jock who will take his girlfriend out in the car to make out point before they both get eaten by werewolves. In the TV series he is very arty, he's into drawing stuff, he seems a bit sort of a modern hipsterish kind of guy and his main conflict is that his family owns and works in a mine and he doesn't really want to go in the mine he's a bit scared of the mine so they've made him less alpha male less macho and less toxically masculine which is another theme that is going to carry through what i'm about to say about the series because i feel like they definitely went at it with a bit of a feminist hammer and tongs before they'd finished creating the the finished article on that subject there is a, a massive plus here in that the cast is a lot more diverse than the characters that were in the comic book i think the only person of color you see in the volume one of the comic is nancy who is only in like a couple of pages because betty and veronica are trying to convince her to be a witch and she's like no i'm not having any truck with that nonsense thank you whereas now in the series you have quite a lot of people of colour who are refreshingly not related to one another, uh, which seems to be the case in quite a lot of other things. It's like you can pinpoint that like, oh, OK, th there's three black people here, but you can almost certainly guess that they are going to be related. 
they are not. So first off, you have Ambrose Spellman, who is Sabrina's house arrested cousin, who in the comic book is just some white British guy with two snakes, but who is played in the series by Chance Podomo, who's like amazing i look forward to all of his scenes because basically he's just replaced salem the cat as the voice of sarcasm love it and he's also very clever and quite charming as well so he's, he's a nice character to have around rosalind walker who i think in the comic book was a red-headed girl at sabrina's mortal school who hated her is now sabrina's friend and is played by jazz sinclair she has a storyline in that she is going slowly blind because of a curse on her family but with the encroaching blindness comes a sort of second sight or the cunning which is what her grandmother refers to it as then you have prudence who is the basically the chief weird sister the weird sisters are a group of three witches who go to the academy of unseen arts which is the witch school as the name would suggest and she is played by tati gabrielle absolutely loved her in every scene that she was in again because she's just so sarcastic and just commanding like you can't stop looking at her because she's just so beautiful and so powerful in terms of like obviously being a very powerful witch and you have also father blackwood's wife lady blackwood who is played by alvina august who is again very beautiful and stunningly evil in one particular episode which i'm not going to spoil but oh what a bitch uh, sadly she does die at the end of the series so I don't think we'll be seeing any more of her, but, you know, it was nice to have her around while she lasted. So generally the casting is a lot more diverse. Those aren't the only characters played by people of colour, but those are like the main ones who are like main characters. So I thought I'd include like a rundown of them. There's also Susie, who is Sabrina's other friend, who is, I don't know if they're just like non-binary or entirely transgender because they're still called Susie and seem to be referred to by people who know them as she so i was a little bit unclear of, of what susie's whole deal was uh, but susie putnam who's the character is dressed very masculinely and it seems to be being bullied for being a boy girl in quote marks which is what people call her um and people were trying to like snatch up her top and like look at her chest and other like really horrifying things but I thought that was quite interesting that they'd included that in the series and I sort of wish that more had been done with it because it feels like it was added in at the last minute and then they kind of forgot to have it discussed or have it matter to other characters beyond where it needed to motivate Sabrina in the first two episodes more on this in a bit so that whole like more inclusive cast and issues face, being faced by the cast it kind of put me in mind of another netflix original series Anne with an e which is like a, a new adaptation of Anne of green gables which i really loved and it definitely felt right to include that in Anne of green gables and they like literally included whole new characters that were in the books to talk about issues such as feminism and racism and all those things that were kind of glossed over previously in other adaptations because you know, it's 2018 and that's something that they wanted to talk about because of the historic period where it was set. I don't think it works as well in Sabrina because I think it's already trying to do quite a lot and those issues ended up kind of getting diluted or lost or forgotten about or they were included in some small moments but they're not really built upon. For example, Susie's uncle is possessed by a demon and the demon calls her an abomination and says that she's going to go to hell for being a boy girl. And at the end of that episode, she is wearing a dress and Sabrina kind of comments on like, oh, you're wearing a dress. I haven't seen you. And she just says, oh, I don't want to be an abomination and then walks off. But then Sabrina never talks to her about this again. None of the other characters do. All that happens is Susie stumbles upon some journals which were written by her aunt Dorothea or great aunt Dorothea, who was one of the like a pioneer in old timey Greendale and who wore men's clothes and like ran a farm and then she starts wearing her normal trousers and jeans and jumpers and stuff again and she seems to have forgotten about what happened with the demon but again it's not really discussed it's not something that she it's not something that the other characters go to her and say look I've noticed your behavior's changed have you been scared or what has happened it's, it's not really tackled in that way she just reverts back to how she was before 
On the Aunt Dorothea subject, Susie starts to see her Aunt Dorothea, like, appearing to her as a ghost, and they talk to each other. And I thought this was perhaps Madame Satan pretending to be her in order to influence Susie, because Madame Satan's whole plan seems to be getting everyone to realise that Sabrina is a witch, in the hopes that that would drive her mortal friends away from her. But that is not revealed at any point to be the case. And I was just left wondering, like, can she see a ghost? Is an actual ghost appearing to her? She hasn't mentioned this to any of the other characters, even when uh, Roz came forward and said, actually, I'm getting this whole psychic power thing happening. She just continued to say that the things that she knew because Dorothea told her, she had learned from Dorothea's journals. So I was really confused by that. And it felt like another thing that hadn't really been thought through that well. The other thing that puzzled me through the, the watching the, of the series is that in the comic, Sabrina is aware of quite a lot of the stuff that the Church of Night does and seems to be pretty clued up on their rituals and what they do. And at her dark baptism, she cuts the head off of a goat with a machete with nary a blink of her eye and doesn't seem to care that much about like that it's an animal sacrifice. She seems pretty down with the satanic aspect of it. And the only reason that her dark baptism doesn't happen in the comic is because Harvey has been tricked into interrupting it and she then has to leave to save him because he's being pursued by witches. In the TV series, she gets to her dark baptism and doesn't seem to realise that she was about to sign her name in a book belonging to Satan. She seems absolutely appalled by the satanic congregation and the news that in signing her name in the book of the beast she is submitting herself to the service of satan and you're like okay maybe she thought that because it's like a religion based around the concept of you have free will and what you want to do is everything that you should do she didn't really realize that she was going to be controlled in such a way which is fine but then as the episodes go on, she kind of has a problem with literally every aspect of this faith in the Church of Night. She doesn't like the human sacrifice at the Feast of Feasts. She doesn't approve of the harrowing, which is like a kind of hazing ritual that people new to the Academy of Unseen Arts go through. And she just doesn't agree with literally any of it. And you sort of start to wonder how she was raised for 16 years in a household that definitely follows the Church of Night and is a believer in Satan and yet remain completely ignorant of everything that they stand for and everything that they've been worshipping. And that kind of put me at odds because it made Sabrina seem like, one, she was hysterically naive about everything that had been going on around her and two, she was acting kind of spoilt and bratty because she was like, oh, actually, you know, I don't think the rules should apply to me. I think there must be like a loophole that I can exploit in literally every situation that I get put in. She's like, I want to resurrect people, but I don't want to have to kill someone in order to do it. I want to have access to my full witch powers, but I'm not really that keen about, you know, joining the Church of Night and praising Satan. I want to study at the Arcane Academy, but I don't want to leave my mortal friends at my mortal school. And the more that happened and the more she kind of said these things, the more I was like, just get a grip, bitch. Because in the comic, she comes across as someone who is 100% on board with this whole Satan witch thing, which is how her family has raised her. But she's also in love with Harvey and she doesn't want him to be hurt and she doesn't want her friends to be hurt either. So she's trying to accept both sides of herself and keep them separate, but also of equal importance in her life. Whereas in the TV series, all it comes across as is she wants to be a normal human mortal girl who doesn't do any of the stuff that her family do, any of the Church of Night stuff, but she does still want to have her magic powers because those are pretty dope. And that made her very difficult to like for me, to be honest, because I felt like other characters like uh, Ambrose had more of a handle on the reality of it. And at one point, Ambrose actually does say, you know, you're just kind of acting like someone who wants to have their cake and eat it too. And maybe that's why I liked him so much as a character, because he said what I was thinking. Now, aside from all that and leaving aside the dissimilarities between it and the comic and some of the issues I had with how the characters were portrayed and the decisions that I made in light of the changes that occur between the two stories, I did really like the series. It was quite action-y. It moved on quite a pace. And there definitely wasn't a moment where I was like, Okay, nothing's really happening. This episode is just filler. 
um, which is something I get a lot with supernaturally themed TV series is like, for instance, Supernatural, where you'll watch an episode and you're like, oh, OK, they just had to come up with something because they needed to do 22 episodes and they only had enough main plot for 15. So here's some random monster of the week crap. It doesn't feel like that at all. Every episode kind of advances the overarching plot, even if it's just in small ways. And while some of them do have monster of the week elements, like the sleep demon that they fight in one episode, it does reveal things about the characters and build things into the plot, which is quite interesting. It took me a little bit of time to warm up to Hilda and Zelda as characters, mainly because Hilda, who is played by Lucy Davis, kind of comes across as being this kind of bumbly awkward rebel wilson type character which is not really a style of humor or character that i tend to get on with particularly well i'm not i i found her a little bit annoying in the first couple of episodes but the more that gets revealed about her character and her backstory the more you i started to warm up to her also zelda originally comes off as quite frosty she's very matriarchal and kind of came off a bit like brie vanderkamp from desperate housewives if brie vanderkamp was a satanist because she's very into like you will do this because it's expected and i will not hear of you doing anything else because you will make this family look bad god damn it and again when you see more into her character she becomes a lot more likeable and you kind of understand why she's there and why that's her personality but it did take me a little while to warm up to them there are some things to do with the show that i was kind of wondering why they had been done the way that they had so i've said that the show has more of a feminist 2018 woke feeling to it than the comic because it's set in like modern times but in that weird riverdale way where Everyone still has old fashioned technology and they like old movies and old music. But occasionally you'll see an Apple Mac, even though everyone is dressing like it's the 1970s. It's just very odd. Anywho, even though that is a setting and everyone's meant to be like, oh, OK, we're not going to tolerate people being transphobic in our school. And we're not going to tolerate people banning books like The Clockwork Orange because they are important for people to read. There are still other things that I was like. Why would you include this in a show where if that's the point you're trying to make? For example, in episode two, there are four football players who have been picking on Susie and one of them punches her in the face and gives her a massive black eye. So Sabrina decides to get revenge on them and she gets the weird sisters, three witches from the academy who hate mortals, specifically mortal men, to come and help her. And they basically plan their revenge they lure them out to a mine and say that they're going to have beers they're going to play music and they're probably going to have sex so all the boys trip along quite willingly and i thought okay they're just going to get them in the dark and then spook them something awful but no the weird sisters and sabrina start making out with the guys and then the camera turns around and shows them all just standing there watching as the guys make out with each other and Sabrina then photographs them and says, I'll show photo these photos to everyone at school if you keep picking on Susie. And that struck me as being like, one, quite rapey, because you've essentially tricked these guys into sex stuff that they didn't consent to. And also you're now like gay shaming them. And I thought that's really weird. Although obviously these are the kind of guys that that would bother. I was like, but why do that when it just, it just kind of undermined the whole point for me. I was just kind of confused as to why they'd done that. There's another bit involving two of the same football players, which is equally as troubling. So they kind of corner Susie later on, like a lot of episodes later on, I think in like the last two episodes in the bookshop where Hilda now works and they start picking on her and Hilda approaches them and says, what you're doing is not okay. You shouldn't do this to Susie. You're being a dick. And yeah, that's fine. That's definitely what you should do if you see someone doing that. And obviously you're a lot older than them. They're in your place of work. So you have the authority to stop them. You're in sort of a safer space to do that. But then she goes on to say that it's not okay what those boys did to you at some account when you were 11 and that your account counselor didn't believe you and that your parents didn't believe you and all this other stuff. But you cannot take that on Susie and you cannot do this. And it's like, OK, so it's pretty clear here that you're saying that he was abused at summer camp and you knew about it and you haven't done anything like witchy to help him in any way. Um, 
which you know you are currently doing witchy stuff to help Susie being who's being bullied so you think that if that's your stance on that you would also take action against people who've done horrible things to him if you knew about it but also you're just bringing that up to him now in like a public place in front of his friend and say oh I know this horrible thing that happened to you that must have been really traumatic now let me weaponize and use it against you and then to top it all off she turns to his friend next to him and is like oh and you have the hots for him don't you and it's like whoa so you've just said that this guy was abused by boys at summer camp probably in a sexual way judging by what she said to him oh also by the way your male friend has the hots for you it just came off as really weird and it's like i get that the thing you're going for is like power to trans people to power to women no minority should be abused but that doesn't mean that it's okay to turn around and do shit like that to characters just because they're like white guys because the whole point of feminism intersectional feminism which is basically what the show is talking about in a lot of different scenes is that it includes everybody and it means that you don't shame victims and you don't weaponize what happened to them to like put them in their place and put them down even if those people are men and it's like that whole scene just made me really uncomfortable and completely blew my mind that they decided to include it and they thought it would be fine similarly although characters were introduced who were gay or i think well, when I was watching the series, I assumed Ambrose was gay because he has a romantic relationship with a man. But apparently he was meant to be pansexual. And the only nod to this was the fact that he's in an orgy that you see for like a couple of minutes in one of the later episodes, which doesn't really do any favours to pansexuals or bisexuals who are constantly being accused of being slutty, slutty, cheater, cheaters. If you're just going to have him be like, oh, OK, but I'm in a monogamous relationship with a man, but also I'll have orgies which happen to have women in them. Regardless, all the characters who, oh, I say all the characters, but it's basically just Ambrose, who have a sexuality that is other than straight, are members of the Church of Night. And it's mentioned when Susie's uncle is possessed by the demon that's possessing him that he is corrupted and so easy to possess because he is a sodomite. So it's underscoring the fact like gay people go to hell, but if you're a witch, it's fine because you're exempt from hell. So I felt like on the one hand, they're like, oh, OK, it's groovy, groovy 2018. We're Netflix. We're making shows that have queer people in them and people of colour in them and trans people in them. But at the same time, we're also going to put all this other stuff in about how like, oh, yeah, those people go to hell. Did you not know that? Which was odd and created this quite uneven tone, which kind of troubled me through the whole series. Looking past all of the slightly weird character choices and some of the world building stuff that they've done for the series, I did really enjoy it. There was quite a lot of quite cool witchy stuff that happened and there was some pretty genuine spookles in there as well, even if some of it did feel a little bit campy and schlocky at times. Like when you see the red angel of death, it looks really tackily made and really bad. So <laughs> that made me chuckle a little bit. And I definitely recommend it because we don't get a lot of new series about witches. And for all the faults that I have just described, it is still pretty entertaining, pretty good. And it does break some new ground in terms of the lore and ideas behind the magic and how it works. Even if we have all seen an episode where people are trapped in nightmares. That's only one episode in the series. But watching it, I was like, I've seen this episode a good five to six times before. And it wasn't interesting then and it's less interesting now. Overall, I would definitely give it a watch, but I say that I definitely prefer the world of the comic book um, because I feel like it just makes more sense out of the whole Satan, witch, normal life dichotomy. Whereas the TV show kind of ends up tying itself in knots by trying to be like, oh, OK, but Sabrina's still a good person. Mainstream America, she's still a good person. I mean, there's all this Satan stuff, but she's not part of that. And it's like, well you've kind of confused yourself I've muddied the water a huge amount so now both sides of the conflict are essentially meaningless and I didn't really get on with either of them the end of the 10 episode run leaves us in a pretty good place plot wise because there's some mysteries that have come out chiefly what Aunt Hilda's boss is because he had like some weird creature eyes at the end of the episode which was like oh what's happening here and also we kind of find out what Satan's end goal is with Sabrina and also Sabrina's friends and Harvey now know that she's a witch and she has spoiler alert signed her name in the book of the beast so that's probably going to change things for her a great deal 
the the next part so the plot has moved on quite quickly and normally i would have expected because it's an american tv show for it to take like 20 episodes to get to anything that actually changes the show because for some reason like english tv shows it's like we have seven episodes in a series and all of the things happen and it's really tight whereas american tv shows are like we'll have 25 episodes a series and fuck all will happen in 15 of those so i really liked that actually stuff had happened and stuff had changed uh, plot wise which was quite cool and i really like where all the characters were at the end of the series they had quite a lot of development uh, specifically ambrose because at uh, the end of the series father blackwood's wife gives birth to a son and he's seen gathering with all of the men of the coven not the women and being like this is a sign that the church belongs to us and it feels like it's going to get into that very men versus women place which is very heavy-handed on the old feminism meter but if it creates some interesting conflict and interesting plot things come out of that then i'm all for it so i will be watching the next 10 episodes whenever they come out and i'm quite excited to see where the series goes but i would also recommend reading the comic because i feel like it tackles quite a lot of the same things but with a lot more consistency and a lot less weird random contradiction going on just to talk about this from a witchy point of view i've seen some places criticizing the series because it makes witches look bad and it makes witches look like they worship satan which we don't there are probably some witches who do follow satanism but not all hashtag not all witches and i didn't really find it that offensive because it's so fantastical and so far removed from anything realistic that i don't see how it could be seen as saying anything about real witches and real wicca and things like that although having said that the catholic church did like try to ban harry potter because they were like it makes kids worship the devil so i guess they don't really care about how similar something looks to real life but because there was basically nothing in it that was similar to Wicca or paganism, it didn't really bother me. The only time anyone even mentions Wicca in the series irritated me enormously, but not because of how I thought it would reflect on my religion. It was because in episodes one and two, Sabrina sets up a society at her school, which is basically like a feminism society, which encompasses like intersectional feminism. So it's like people like Susie and people like Roz who are like facing discrimination within the school and they call it the Women's Intersectional Cultural and Creative Association which spells Wicca and then then refer to it as hey what's Wicca group doing or what can Wicca do for you and I was just like oh my god you crowbarred that in and it hurts me every time you say it because it's so crap but aside from that i was free of all worries it definitely came across as more fantasy than ripped from the headlines reality so i appreciated that i hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll tune in for the next episode when the next 10 episodes are released and in the meantime do go and check the show out on netflix because it is really good and also if you can get your hands on a copy of the comic book just to read and compare and just see which one you like more i'd be interested to know your thoughts you can get in touch on twitter which is at witchfix or by email which is witchfixpodcast at gmail.com and i'll see you in the next episode bye